I think so. Yeah. Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, I think it's really important for every clinic to develop their own uh, SOPs, standardized operating procedures, have a list of everything that has to be done regarding a standard way of uh, consenting, standard way of uh, using anesthesia, antiseptic, recommendation for the patient before. With chemistry Rx, you should also have the to how to order for each patient because it will be basically hard to have a stock on the clinic, right? So you have to figure all that all that in your clinic and also give some post-operative care written to the patients. There is one, one article there that talks about their standard of care, which I think is a good uh, basis. And I'll, I'll mention here what I do. Uh, for anesthesia, usually I only use topical lidocaine, and that's usually enough. And uh, from my heart, it's better to use a bald patient's lidocaine because with, with a lot of hair, it just gets too messy. It's, oh, it's such a pain to remove all the lidocaine from the scalp with hair. So uh, what I do with patients who have a lot of hair, like women, I, I use lidocaine over the same points that I block or pliaglis or higher concentration uh, anesthetics and I leave it for a long time and I usually use only topicals. For patients who cannot wait on the waiting room with the topicals, I inject, I block, uh, which I would say it's about 5% of patients, uh, very little. And uh, the block is more important on the frontal part, I'll, I'll explain. Um, cleansing, I only use alcohol. In Brazil, I used to have a Jack Daniels bottle with ethanol, 70%, and it would spray uh, the scalp and remove all the alcohol. The patients found it very funny because it was like a barber shop. Uh, here, there's a isopropyl alcohol, and I think that, that can be a standard. You can use uh, chlorhexidine if you're more worried about the bacteria infection. Um, PPE, absolutely recommended. Now we are used to using masks and, uh, you know, shields. Uh, I use only non-sterile gloves. Uh, it's very important to try to keep everything as clean as possible to avoid cross-contamination, especially when using tattoo machines. Um, well, here's how I block the frontal uh, scalp. I usually do the first injection, the lateral part, as close as possible to the area that I'll uh, inject. And I fan to one side, fan to the other side, and inject Lido with Epi. And then I enter on the, on the side that is anesthetized from the first injection, and I give another line of injection, and then the third one to the midline. And I do the same on the other side three injections. And that completely blocks the center part, frontal part of the, the scalp, which is more sensitive. The facial, um, uh, let's say the cranial nerves, they are more sensitive than the cervical nerves. And usually that's enough. Even for patients who are very sensitive with, with pain, they can tolerate the pain on the back. They feel like they have uh, scratches, like a cat scratching their scalp. But the frontal part, sometimes they sneeze. And the same area, if you apply a very strong topical anesthetic for a long time, it also provides a good anesthetic to the scalp. Pliaglis, uh, I've used multiple times and it works perfectly. But you can also compound the stronger ones there. Um, and um, well, on the back, here's a patient that is easier to see how I inject because uh, there's this this occipital, occipital uh, prominence there in the, the back of the skull. And I, I use my, my hand, I put uh, the pinky finger on the, um, on the occipital prominence, and I put the index finger on the mastoid of the patient. And I inject where my two fingers fit, which is basically here. Um, and that blocks the the two occipital nerves 
and the same on the other side. And I give one central bolus and then I fan to one side to the other, four little injections and that completely anesthetizes the back of the scalp. And then the only part that is remaining is basically the temples, which we rarely in inject. Some females we do. And here's uh, another advice. I never inject where there's trapezius or the muscle. I try to look for where the trapezius is not there, which the nerve is more superficial. And yeah. And this is also great for headaches, this block. Um, the temporal block, I usually do a large bolus. I inject a lot of volume around some three cc's, two cc's in one single bolus of dilute uh, lidocaine with epi. And I try to make that ball spread all over to the top of the ear. After 10 minutes, the temple is all blocked. Uh, I personally don't do that much. It doesn't. Uh, it's usually not that sensitive, this area. And uh, well, rarely the patients need injection of the temporary too. Um, well, about the test rate, uh, we have it in 0.1% formula and you saw that there were no articles with uh, playing the test rate in literature, right? So what we do is um, we dilute it. If you're using only the test rate, you dilute it with uh, bacteriostatic water, which minimizes the pain. And um, when you mix with uh, minoxidil, you mix one part of each, uh, which confers 0.05%, which is obviously stronger. But if you dilute more, you get the 0.01%, which is the newer articles from Spain and Mexico. They were using it at, at that concentration. And that provides a little more volume for the price. So maybe if you order one, you can do in multiple patients, you can dilute more. But I would personally say that from my experience, I never injected that dilute, only 005, and that's where I'll show my results. And um, uh, minoxidil is a little more viscous. So sometimes you need to use a, a larger needle so you don't have uh, to put a lot of pressure in your thumb. And uh, I try to use, this mesotherapy needles, which are shorter, they're four millimeters. I don't like this uh, gadgets with many needles because you know it's really hard to get all the needles uh, to be injected. And plus, you don't don't feel if one needle is too deep or or in a blood vessel or something. So I prefer to use uh, only one needle. And here's an example. This is a patient with a minoxidil with transinolol, uh, and uh, it's important to feel the resistance. If there is no resistance, then you don't inject because you're probably in a blood vessel. And I usually, um, I had, let's say if, if I'm not doing any anesthetic, sometimes I use a little bit of a lidocaine just to give a little more comfort. So I start on the back and I move to the front when I'm injecting on the, the vertex. And, and you see, it's really fast when you get the, the feel of how much to inject. We inject usually uh, 0, 0.05 per centimeter or one centimeter and a half, one inch. Um, and then you try to inject more where the patient needs more, right? Um, or where the patient wants more. And here's with... Um, a larger needle, uh, um, a standard needle with a 3CC syringe to see how it's also possible to, to use this one, but I'm doing more effort on the thumb. It's not as comfortable for me. Um, and you just introduce the, the very tip of the needle there just to, to be very superficial. So it's a harder technique than using the very sh short needles, which are the four millimeters or the called uh, mesotherapy needles. And this is minoxidil with dutasteride being injected there. 
and this patient had no anesthetic, uh, not even topical. You know, most patients they they tolerate. And here's a side effect that was I published. Uh, Mark Heppel, who is here, is one of my co-authors. Uh, but here's uh, what happened. Uh, it's a good patient, very uh, close patient, and she wanted to. She started losing some hair. I thought she she was developing diffuse alopecia areata, or maybe some starting to have um, um, androgenic alopecia. And then we decided to to start the injection of transcinolone, and it was very dilute transcinolone. I mixed with minoxidil. It was one one milligram per cc, or or maybe two milligrams, uh, and and she developed the spots that were very firm and atrophic, and I knew that this was not atrophy from transcinolone. And I thought she had lupus or something. I, I told her, well, no, this is weird. Uh, maybe we were having some other disease and I really think you'd need a biopsy. And I rarely, rarely do biopsies. So I sent to the best hair pathologist of Brazil. And well, she had this um, huge fibrosis with some granulomas with a lot of uh, oil droplets, Swiss cheese appearance surrounding the transcinolone uh, deposit. So, uh, well, that can happen. Um, uh, sclerosing lipogranuloma, she had no fat whatsoever. And the punch bled a lot, the two punches. Um, there was no fat. I basically had to cut by the, the muscle there and that was caused by the syringe lubricant which i was never aware that it could cause any side effect and here's the syringe that i used it was very lubricated since then and i avoid this one unless i'm feeling some acne scars with some fillers or then i try to use that to inject a little uh, permanent filler but uh, not for the scalp never more and we uh, developed this technique of flushing the syringes uh, three times with saline, uh, just to flush the silicone oil out. And that's especially important for the ophthalmologists who inject uh, antibodies on the eyes. There was a huge problem and still some retina specialists, they, they're not aware and they inject silicone oil mixed with uh, their antibodies and that causes UVIs and a lot of problems. Gustavo Barreto Mello, he's one of the main researchers of silicone oil in the eye and he did great research and recently we we published this letter because there were some granulomas after prp and uh, for me that's absolutely only uh, um, silicone oil and anyways uh, there's also some scarring after mesotherapy which can be the same thing just the silicone oil or you need a biopsy right to, to check and uh, Silicon oil, it's hard to see on the biopsy because it's uh, like a ghost. Um, and uh, and there's also this frontal edema after mesotherapy and some patients have this allergic reaction on the face. I think that can be from some vehicles, maybe propylene glycol, if the patients are allergic. This is uh, from last year. And the uh, recent uh, article, a large series of Mexico, they saw it in three cases, and let's, let's say could happen in uh, about 1% with that formula. And uh, well, I use uh, tattoo machines because they are more superficial. I can get more the miniaturized hair uh, level. And also we expose the patient to last drug. It's called drug tattooing or microinfusion of drugs through the skin. It's a registered brand from a Brazilian dermatologist, Dr. Samir Arbrache. And uh, well, the tattooing technique is absolutely different from microneedling. So microneedling, you poke the needles with no fluid around the needles. And there's basically air to be sucked by the skin when you remove the solid. There's a vacuum that forms when you remove the solid. 
and the vacuum absorbs any fluid that is over there. So when you do that with microneedling, there's only air, and then the air is expelled with the blood as it, as it bleeds. While the tattooing, it sucks the ink, if it's a, an artistic uh, tattoo, or drugs, if you use the drugs instead of ink. And for example, there's been a trial that they tried to microneedle and spread some topical minoxidil on the top that basically had the same effect of topical minoxidil. So it's not the same thing. And I would not advise anyone to, to get a tattoo machine and try on their own. You need some training. And I'm planning some workshop later. I'll, I'll get my email here for anybody who's interested. Maybe do it here at Brown in the near future. So, uh, you know, the tattoo machines, they have many needles. Uh, there's some that we call the liners. There's some that are the shaders. There's the magnums, which are more like broad brushes. And uh, they all have different ways of depositing uh, fluid to the skin. And there are many articles published about this with 5FU and even drugs for leishmaniasis. And well, basically the deposit is in the papillary dermis, which is where we want to deliver the drug. And we can get a more uniform delivery instead of multiple bolus. Right, and um, uh, Dr. Arbashi, Arbashi, who basically started this technique in Brazil, he measured how much volume we deposit, and it's usually one thousandth of the volume that actually goes down to the skin or artificial skin. Uh, so you get less exposure to the to the drugs or less side effects, right? Because you inject less and the superficial dermis probably has less systemic absorption um, and here's a transversal cut you see all the needles where they poked where the the ink spread there and um here's the technique i'm using here the 15 shader and this is a uh, on a slow motion with the iphone just to show the needle going back and forth. We cannot see the needle going back and forth because it's so fast, it's like 100 Hertz. Um, and we try to avoid the hair, try to go around the hair so we don't cut the hair with the needles. And we try to paint the skin with uh, the liquid. And every once in a while, we had to go back to the ink cup and dip the needles in the ink cup to deliver more drug. And the end point is this pinpoint bleeding that you see on the other part of the scalp, which means you, you reached the dermis, right? If it doesn't bleed, you're only in the epidermis. It's probably better than just topical. You reach, uh, you know, the epidermis, not only the corner layer, but it's better to see some minor bleeding. So you know you're on the papillary dermis. And uh the first uh, report on liter literature was uh, from Leticia Contin. She compared microneedling alone with microneedling with minoxidil. She saw, saw benefit in both. She had the impression that minoxidil worked a little better. Um, and she had more sessions on one patient. But anyways, that was the first uh, article published about tattooing. And this is... a. Uh, not in slow motion, so you see, see the speed of application. You see the Jack Daniels there on the top? That's, <laughs> that's not Jack Daniels, that's just 70% ethanol. And really, uh, there's a proper technique of holding the machine. You, you don't want to cause any scars. And it's really hard to learn by yourself. There's...
Okay. And uh, I used to mix uh, the test rate with an oxy one to one. That's the final concentrations that I got. And most of the patients that use this other um, needle, which is the Magnum, which is like a broad brush brush for patients with thinner hair or they have more uh, alopecia. And that's a faster technique. And also the needles, they deliver more fluid. So you have to dip more in the ink cup. And this is a result of a patient. He, he had a tattoo done on his scalp. You can see the little brown uh, dots there. That's an actual tattoo that it wasn't me who do, did it. He did it to camouflage his baldness. And he was very, um, uh, he didn't like them. They, he wanted to remove the tattoo. But then I said, no, let's just grow some more hair. And after, this is after, I think, two sessions. Uh, a lot of difference. Again, before, you see the same tattoos there and after. This is a, a good case of, you see how the terminal hair just improved a lot afterwards. Uh, you see on the frontal part, there's some little terminal hair. And then after it's all covered with a terminal hair and some intermediary hair. And this is after three sessions, um, a close up to see in detail. You can see the nevus here on the front of the scalp. Another patient, I always check the nevus to see the distance between the hair and the nevus you see on the right side of the picture. There's three little nevus, you can see the distance. This is also after three sessions. And he was also taking oral dutasterate for at least six months before I started the intralesional therapy. And um, another case, with good volume and this patient to be very sincere, uh, he, um, he was taking, I had prescribed oral test rate for six months and I wasn't seeing any result. And he was using topical minoxidil. And then we started after one year, he said, you know, I'll be sincere. I wasn't taking oral test rate that much. And even after the sessions, I was growing hair, so I wasn't, uh, I was taking say once a week or I wasn't very compliant. So sometimes when you don't see the results is that because the patients are not compliant and sometimes they tell you that they are compliant. And then after some years they tell that, but anyways, after I left Brazil, he started shedding hair because he went back to usual care and it, then he became compliant and still didn't grow anyways. Uh, this is the case of the tattoo of the scalp that I showed before. Huge difference and everywhere, not only on the vertex. Um, another case, I didn't see much improvement on this case compared to the other ones. Uh, and this was a patient that we did, let's say, every two months for many years after this picture here. Um, and, you know, some growth, some patients, they don't grow that much. But you, it's very important to take the pictures, overhead pictures like that, compare and have the feedback and discuss with the patients if they want to do more or not. I usually don't take the, pay, the pictures every single session. I try to space, let's say, every three months. And this is another good case. And this is after three sessions. And uh, here are some the nevus so you can compare around the nevus to see uh, the hair growth there between them and on the other side there is also the nevus there you see how many uh, intermediary vellus hair that started to appear that were, were not noticeable before and um, there's another case this is my father uh, who you know we started and i didn't see much different certainly some improvement but not to the extent that i wanted and he wanted and we 
we did multiple sessions. He never achieved a, he's a case for hair transplant, but he doesn't want to do it. Um, and this is a case that had hair transplant in the past and he lost, he wasn't compliant to usual care. Uh, and then he wanted to try the, the technique because a friend um, uh, had done and um, I didn't see any velus hair on his scalp. And I told him that he probably wouldn't get much results, but he could try. And we tried years after three sessions, we got some improvement. There was uh, some hair growth, but not to the extent that it would make a change. And you see how much photo aging on his scalp and a uh, very chronic situation. And here's, oh, sorry, there's a, an overlap, sorry. This is a patient for beard. Um, so for the beard, we cannot use the test, right? Because it inhibits hair growth of the beard. And this patient, he wanted to have more beard and he had alopecia and androgenetic alopecia. So he, he didn't want, um you know if we started to test right for his scalp he would have less beard and uh he was back in the day we i wasn't using oral minoxidil yet i would certainly use for this case uh so we started injecting minoxidil and he had uh, some growth of hair on the beard area and then we were also using on the scalp and he didn't want to use any of the test, right? Because he was worried about having less beard, which was, he wanted to become a bald man with a lot of beard. And, uh, well, sorry, this, this picture is in front. Let me just escape here just to show you the results on his mustache. So he had some results that's with uh, about, four sessions of minoxidil. And let me, post-op instructions, don't wash the hair for 24 hours. Don't submerge for a week to avoid any mycobacterial infections. Because as we know, mesotherapy is kind of linked to infections. And we always think that, oh, maybe it's just a compounding pharmacy that didn't do their job. But it can be just that the patient just went to the ocean or or was exposed to a bathtub and had some inoculation. And with pressure of water, they can get infection just like on tattoos. Um, no hair dye for a week. I think that's important, even though we know the hair dye doesn't uh, doesn't tattoo. Uh, if not used through needles, the same microneedling plus hair dye doesn't tattoo. Uh, but the patients, they can have some allergic reaction and they also can get more exposure to the hair dry and become allergic to hair dye. So I tell them not to use anything on the hair for a week or sprays, anything that they can become allergic to. And uh, also in the summer, it's very important to avoid insects especially flies, some patients, they sleep on a hammock and they have blood on their scalp that can, um, they can have some flies and some issues with the scalp. So if they are outside, I tell them to use a cap, um, something to protect their scalp. And also it's important to individualize the plan. As we saw in literature, a lot of physicians, they're using every three months. I think that's too long. Uh, I try to start every month and then space through two months and then try to space for three months. Um, and I try to take pictures every two sessions or so, three sessions. And um, why not start with every two weeks and then space, you know, if the patient is very uh, desperate for improvement, I think that would be uh, a good choice. Then you impregnate more drug. Um, but anyways, you have to think, for each patient, that's my approach. I don't have a protocol that I follow for every single patient. And, um, or maybe every month, five sessions, and then try to do every two months, five sessions, and then every three months, forever. Every season change, they get an injection, just like some biologics uh, for psoriasis. And 
Uh, here's a picture from Instagram from my friend Daniela Tarquinio. She was like, oh yeah, microinfusions of drugs for females, uh, for women. And as I mentioned there, be careful with the test right for females with childbearing potential because it has a very long half-life. It's not like finasteride, which is just like Accutane. Six months, at least, of birth control. Um, I try to use the test rate only in females who uh, cannot have child, uh, let's say, after menopause or after surgery. Um, finasteride is safer. So in my practice, I would use for females of uh, childbearing potential under birth control finasteride. Uh, and then I would do the same thing that I do with Accutane. And the take home message there is that the therapy can reverse miniaturization of the hair. It is an add-on therapy. I would not recommend it to be a monotherapy, but as we saw in the literature, it also works as monotherapy. Um, density of vellus hair is my predictor of efficacy. So I'll say if I see a patient with a lot of vellus hair, that's the perfect candidate. Um, and also examine if there's a lot of sun damage, no vellus hair, you see under trichoscopy, no vellus hair. I would not motivate the patients to do it, but you know, can they can always try. You never know. Some patients can have some good results. Okay, this is my email, drwambier at brown.edu. If you're interested also to, to learn the tattooing technique, please email me. I'll try to form a group and um, maybe have a workshop. Uh, in the near future. I think that's a very interesting technique. Now let's go to the final discussion. Thanks so much, Carlos. I mean, I have a couple of questions already. already. Uh, one is uh, two parts. So with the intralesional minoxidil, do you expect any initial shedding? And then the second part of the question, what minoxidil strength uh, do you inject? I, I am, I've injected uh, multiple uh, concentrations of minoxidil. Uh, I, even, I even injected 5% uh, minoxidil on certain for, formula and everything. But I, I always think that the more concentrated, the best results. And um, uh, so the usual concentration that I use that I saw, that I showed on the cases there, it was 0.25% of minoxidil. So that means it's about one third of the concentration of the formula that Lars uh, is, has standardized. And, but here's the thing, if you mi mix with the test, right, then you, you have uh, even more concentration of minoxidil, which is great. I try to restrict the amount that I use to two cc's and that's important to have a restriction. Sometimes you cannot cover the whole scalp, and that's okay. Um, but I don't go beyond two cc's because of the dose. So we have studies that show that in females, that uh, master science study from Barbara, she measured blood pressure of the patients using 0.5% of uh, minoxidil. She didn't see any dec decrease of blood pressure. She monitored that. And uh, anyways, just respect the dose. The same with uh, the test, right? So say you, you never ask a patient to take four capsules of the test right once. So you never inject a lot of the test right in the same way. So I would say the maximum dose is a capsule, which is something orally known and also studied. Some, good literature any um, other questions there Lars? yeah so we have a question on uh, do you have a specific syringe that you use do you always flush your syringes with uh, saline before you use them and uh, where do you get uh, needles for mesotherapy from well uh, needles for mesotherapy uh, there used to be even in at Alaska they would sell but I usually do my research uh, usually where you get your usual needles. They're just four millimeter length needles. Uh, you can look for internet for some good sources. 
Um, and uh, yes, I if I use on the scalp syringe that is lubricated, I always flush three times with saline. That's so fast, and then I I feel that they are not as well lubricated. But you know that's for safety of my patients. The the main uh, thing is that the larger the syringe, the more silicone oil there is. So say if you use a 10 cc syringe, it has more oil than the thin ones. But as I showed there, that BD 1 cc is extremely lubricated. That's why it's so good to use. But uh, well, I always flush if I have to use that one. Um, there's other lure lock 1 cc syringes. I also, also do a little flushing before mixing with bacteriostatic saline. and uh, well, I have my preference to use the norm jacks, the syringes that, are, that they don't have silicone oil inside, they are plastic on plastic, uh, but the lure locks are only available for the 3 cc's, 5 cc's, 10 cc's, 20 cc's. For the 1 cc syringe, which is the best one to use because it provides more pressure, they don't have any lure lock because if you're pushing too hard, um, they don't want the liquid to backfire in your face, so it detaches the needle, so the liquid goes to the front. Uh, I find that that syringe works fine for injections on the scalp, which is the norm eject 1cc. It is not lure lock, so you have to be very careful, attach it really well, and uh, be careful not to do too much pressure on your thumb. And that's the one that I would recommend for everybody to use. And if if you're doing too much pressure, just use one with lure lock. If it's lubricated, just flush before that's uh, to avoid any side effects. And particularly for triencinolone, always do that because many cases that you you think it's atrophy, it's only retraction of fat. Okay, something we have is, um, did you um, ever had um, a patient who did not respond to all minoxidil and or did not respond to all dutasteride, but then did respond to intralesional therapy? Oh, yeah. that's the, I would say all the patients that I've ever uh, started the intralesional therapy, they were all with standard therapy before. I always try to make a plan when, let's say, first time someone comes up, to my office, which is rare. Usually they are referred, uh, but first time I say, yeah, hey, you need the basics. Just start 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, minoxidil. Uh, and in the past I would use topical minoxidil. Nowadays I only use uh, oral minoxidil. And um, yeah, some patients, they don't respond that well, or they, they only respond to a certain extent and they have a lot of values here and they're stuck there. So we can increase the dose of minoxidil um, but then I think that's a good situation to just to go to injectables to increase the concentration with less uh, side effects. So I usually give them six months of standard care, standard of care. If in six months they're not satisfied with only the tablets and capsules, then I go straight to injection. And, and well, um, with oral minoxidil now, probably there's more efficacy like we saw with that article from from Spain that Dr. Sinclair was the last article, uh, last author there, that they saw that there was improvement of both oral minoxidil and oral minoxidil with interlesional dutasteride, but the verdicts made a huge difference with the uh, interlesional dutasteride. And um, what is your thinking around intralesional dutasteride? So at the strengths that you inject, 0 0.05, um, would you expect systemic absorption or no? Yes, I expect some systemic absorption. And if you inject 2 cc or 1 cc of that, uh, it is the same of one capsule of dutasteride. So say if you do every month or every three months, every two months, that's like a single capsule of the test right taken by mouth. Uh, so it minimizes the adverse events. I personally try to add that to someone who's already taking it by mouth. 
because you, I try to push the oral effects of the medication. But you know, there's always patients who, who are very concerned about erectile dysfunction. And that's the case that I would say, let's not even go to oral. If you're, if you're, if you're ever afraid, then you have the nocebo effect and they're like all this uh, post finasteride syndrome things. And some patients, they're really, really scared. And I don't push, I say, hey, do you want to try intralesional? Uh, and we expose you to less drug. Yeah. Um, then we have a lot of questions on PRP. Uh, can you combine intralesional minoxidil and lutasteride with PRP? And where do you think in your treatment ladder um, uh, is PRP and uh, minoxidil and lutasteride intralesional? How, how, how are you, uh, what is your thinking around that? Yeah, yeah, you know, when PRP started in Brazil, I was, I was already using uh, minoxidil with, uh, you know, my combinations and everything. So I, I tried PRP, I didn't see any more benefit than minoxidil. Uh, and when the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors were available, then I was like, whoa, my God, that's much better. I tried to mix with uh, finasteride, especially for women with intelligent effluvium. I think PRP has a, a great benefit for telogen effluvion. But, um, well, uh, on my personal experience, I would say I would choose between one, either drugs or PRP. But uh, uh, Dr. Sergio Vanio Galvan in uh, Madrid, which I, res he, I respect him a lot, and uh, he shares with me the same opinion that the test rate is much more uh, there's much more effect with uh, dutasteride than PRP, but he sometimes he mixes PRP with dutasteride, especially if the patient wants PRP very bad, then he tries to convince the patient to mix. But um, that's my my opinion. I think we can choose one, and if you microneedle, they kind of have the same effect of PRP, which is just the the growth factors there working on the epidermis. And yeah, that's my general view. But I would say I don't have much experience of combining dutasteride with PRP. But you know, Sergio Galvan, he has plenty of experience, and he says, "Yes, I do that a lot." At least it seems safe. And um, Carlos, just to uh, clarify one more time, so you do have patients who are on all dutasteride and also get intralesional dutasteride on top of that. Oh yeah, yeah, that's like the the standards, the push. All the patients that I showed there, they were all on the oral dutasteride. Right? Uh, my my patient, and you see some patients they don't respond because you know you have the all the systemic absorption. There's very little concentration that reaches the scalp. Uh, maybe it would be the case of using higher systemic uh, dose of the test, right? But uh, I I don't advise that. I don't think. There was a few studies with, uh, let's say, higher doses of the test, right? And yeah, I combine, I combine. And I think that's the ideal scenario to have the usual care well-established and just add that to the top. But you know, some patients, they don't want to take uh, the test. For the uh, sexual side effects of the test, right? I would say it's more common than on literature, but it's really in the first week and, or two. After they, they raise their testosterone and they achieve the balance, usually all the sex, uh, sexual side effects, they, they go away. Um, but you know, some patients, they're very scared and I, I don't want to push. Okay. Um, one question that I can answer really quick. So when you receive the order forms from us, um, it is important that you, uh, you specify the patient's procedure date. Um, we will ship um, the, the injectables as close to the procedure date as possible. Um, this is because of the FDA regulation um, around compounded steroids. FDA is very strict, um, but um, yeah, we will ship this close to your patient's procedure date. Um, the shelf life that FDA would like us to put on the injectables and this is regardless of what the drug is, what the formula is, this is simply a regulation for compounded sterilized. It's going to be uh, two weeks. Um, 
And then um, we have um, uh, one uh, question, Carlos, for you. Um, so how do you decide when to go from a patient who is on all therapy to add um, intralesional or switch to intralesional? Do you use shedding as an indicator or patient's happiness? Um, how, how, do you, how do you make yes. the switch? So I, uh, my, my idea is to, uh, that the intralesional, is all, there's always more efficacy than the oral, uh, but I don't use it as a standard of care. So uh, let's say if the patient, they are not satisfied with the standard of care, I give that extra step. I say that it's like climbing the ladder. You can always go to uh, further steps and we start with the basics. And yeah, uh, you know, shedding, I, I, I don't even listen to my patients when they say they're shedding because, you know, it can be only a change of hair and when they, when we inject minoxidil or when they take minoxidil, they say, oh, it's shedding hair. And then you look, oh, you have much more hair. <laughs> what matters is the appearance, right? The density or the volume of hair. Um, and sometimes they shed, especially with minoxidil. That's extremely common. But I tell, that's the old hair shedding and there's a new hair coming that is stronger. Of course, sometimes that's a nutritional deficiency or something or as always. We always uh, try to stop the the, the shedding. Uh, there's a question there about uh, pedodema or cardiac side effects with uh, injectable minoxidil. I've never seen a single case. And uh, when it happens with oral minoxidil, it takes a while. So let's say the patients are taking oral minoxidil every single day. And then after two weeks or after a month, they start noticing edema. So the edema happens because the body compensates the vasodilation by holding more salt on the food. So the body's trying to uh, increase the blood pressure by holding more salt and that increases the edema. Um, and uh, that happens when the pressure lowers a little bit and then the body just stabilizes the pressure. So it takes some days for that to happen. It's not with a single injection every month. Um, that's a you know huge benefit, and I would transition someone who had edema orally. I uh, try to reduce the dose of oral minoxidil, and I would say, hey, let's inject, so you you have less of that problem. And for females, do uh, spirulina lactone just resolve that. Any other? Oh, yeah. Question? Yeah, one more. Um, did you ever see any contact dermatitis um, after injecting? Uh, I've seen uh, a patient who who was who had contact dermatitis to propylene glycol, so he couldn't stand topical minoxidil, and he was a big bodybuilder and he was using hormones and losing the hair. And I yeah said yeah let's use some injectables, and um, Lars, do we have propylene? Glycol on the formulas? No, right? No. Or it's a secret. Definitely not. We, we don't even have propylene but, glycol in the pharmacy. I'm kidding, but <laughs> yeah, but but anyways, uh, so we he had like a contact dermatitis even after uh, the microneedling or even after the injections. Um, he didn't have any deeper, um, let's say, allergies or granulomas or anything. He had more a superficial contact dermatitis and we then uh, I checked the formula had some propylene glycol and yeah he had the past test and yeah it can happen um how much do you charge the patient for an injection is one question well that's a good question so i say the united states is a completely different market from the, from europe from brazil and you know things here I'm really perplexed of how much patients spend on Botox or fillers. So I would say it depends on your clinic. Uh, I would say charge at least what you charge for a PRP, um, maybe more because there's more efficacy or there's more value to efficacy, right? Um, I don't know. I I'm thinking of starting here with 500 uh, at Brown as soon as I get the first shipment. Um, or maybe, who knows, 400 and something. It depends if we're using both 
or only one formula. And you see there's a, Lars doesn't want to hear this, but because of the dilution, you can use a formula in two patients, right? You can, it's not, you know, it's for one patient, but if you schedule two brothers, <laughs> who knows, you can kind of share. Uh, you're the physician and you decide and you can dilute the formula. Uh, and as you saw, there's a good evidence with the, the test rate 001. Um, I would say it depends on your market. The higher concentration, the better. It's like Botox, right? You don't want to dilute Botox and, and micro injections and the patient that around didn't last. So you all learn as you go. Um, uh, just to confirm, most patients do not need numbing. Yeah, most patients, they don't need numbing, but it's painful, right? They're, they're injections. So let's see, on my routine, uh, even my MAs, sometimes they, they've been MAs to other dermatologists, they're like, oh my God, you don't numb anyone. And yeah, the Botox fillers are just inject and the patients are like, oh yeah. That was almost painless uh, compared to the other time. So it depends on your technique. Of course, if you're like digging the needle and uh, poking a lot, so it's very painful. And the thing is that the injection itself doesn't hurt. So uh, as soon as you get the needle and try to inject, so there's this numbing from the injection. The same with transcinolone. And, and anesthetic, know. injectable anesthetic makes makes it hurt more. So if I inject with anesthetic, I start where there's the nerves and I inject very slowly on the first injections to minimize the injection of the anesthetic. And everybody can figure out. Uh, I would say you can start with a friend, check how's the pain level and you can you can always number to the block the blocks if needed right and you can always change in the middle let's say the patient says, oh no i'm brave and then you start and they're like oh my god i'm like oh so much pain then you say okay i'll do a block let's do a little block here five minutes complete okay and um, uh, when you dilute the uh, dutasteride from uh, 0 0.1 percent to 0 0.05 uh, with bacteriostatic water, uh, can you describe the process how you do that? Uh, when I mix uh, the test rate with bacteriostatic water, so let's say you get a syringe that has silicone oil, so you flush with the uh, bacteriostatic water three times and just dispose. And then I I get more bacteriostatic water. And I, then I go to the vial that has the test rate and I fill it up uh, half and half. And then you, you have the, the concentration 005. That's how, how it's done. It's just like transcinolone, how you dilute, right? So it just, it's not a suspension. So it's a solution. And then it's easier. If you see that there is a cloud or um, some different re um, refraction of light, just mix the syringe with a bubble until it's uh, uniform and then you're all set and um uh, did you ever use normal saline instead of water bacteriostatic water yes yes that's feasible but here's the thing uh the more uh solute the more you can crystallize the injectables so the same with Kybella, for example, if you dilute it uh, with saline, then you you can create salts of the oxycholic acid. So uh, yeah, just bacteriostatic water is always safer. And also it, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't cause any osmotic, uh, you know, disruption or anything. Uh, but yeah, you can use saline. If you only have saline there, I would use it. I would use it. Uh, and, and I'll tell you something. Bacteriostatic water, it's become really expensive from Hospira or the, the brand Pfizer bought Hospira and somehow they made it direct. So Lars, here's an, a suggestion. 
you can yeah. start compounding bacteriostatic water there and uh, sell it cheaper, may, way cheaper than uh, Hospira. But then you you have to use it in two weeks. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, congratulations to Dr. Rambio from Dr. Walsh. Um, and um, yeah, I think um, that is all I have in terms of uh, questions. Um, yeah, so I mean, thank you very much again, uh, Carlos, to this, uh, for this amazing presentation and for doing this uh, tonight for everyone. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, it was super informative. I think it's super exciting, um, especially the pictures. Um, I think super impressive. So thanks so much for Thank pushing you. this therapy along and thanks for educating everyone oh. on it. And um, thank you everyone for um, attending tonight. Thanks for coming. And- You're um, welcome. Yeah. Oh, and I, I just saw <laughs> one, one last question here. I, I didn't know, uh, Maria Teresa, Teresa so Soares, TT is here. And uh, she asked one question. And by the way, I learned how to use the tattoo machine with her. Um, I was using the wrong way. I was injecting inside the needle, like uh, splashed everything all over. But she, she taught me how to use the ink cup and everything. So she asked here, can you send, oh, here's the, her question here. So the, the equivalence of one tablet of uh, Dutasteride 05 equals one ml of the Duta 0.1. So actually uh, I'm mentioning that one ml of Duta 0, 0.05 is equivalent because of the milligrams, just the milligrams uh, per cc. So when you say uh, 0 0.5 milligrams per cc, that's exactly 0.05%. So just on that sense. Of course, in the oral, uh, when you take by mouth, there is the liver metabolism. So it's a lipid soluble molecule. It goes to the liver. It can get some breaking by the liver, but just thinking of systemic effects is about the same distribution on the body and everything. Okay. Thank you everybody uh, for the presence. And then I hope you, you start soon. And I, uh, if you have any questions, just ask Lars and he can also send some questions to me. Okay, and you have my email there, Dr. Wandier at brown.edu. If you have any specific questions that are, you can, please feel free to email me, okay? Thank you, you everybody, well. have a great thank night. And thank you, Lars, for bringing this to the United States. Finally, we have it. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.